everyone, I'm Charlotte. And I'm Dina. Welcome to The Grim Curriculum. Episode 30 of The Grim Curriculum. Isn't that wild? And friends, what better time to launch another series? This time we are covering someone that we've been wanting to do for a while and we know many of you feel the same. That's right. So today we are covering the one, the only, Eileen Wernos. She is probably one of the better known people that we have covered due to the fact that her story has been told in countless books, movies, and documentaries. She was even famously played by Charlize Theron in the movie Monster. She is also known by many as the first female serial killer. And, and that obviously isn't accurate. We've covered quite a few women who came before her that would be considered the first female serial killer. Look at Baba Anuka from last week. Exactly. But we wanted to take a moment to clear up what is actually meant by that when referring to Eileen Wuornos before we even start the episode. She was one of the first kind of this killer, yes, but not the first female serial killer. So Eileen was a drifter killer who targeted men throughout Central and North Florida as she hitchhiked during the late 80s, early 90s. Her weapon of choice was a 22 pistol. Both of these things are incredibly uncommon for women who kill. Again, we've seen this in multiple women that we've covered in the past. She also stands out because she acted alone and she targeted people that she did not know who were also not known to one another. These things, along with the fact that she killed the number of people that she did over an extended period of time, make her the first woman to fit the FBI definition of a serial killer. Eileen would claim that the murders were done in self-defense, but her story would change the closer that she got to her execution. We have a lot to cover here. This is an incredibly complicated case for a multitude of reasons. It really is. This is one of those cases that really make you think about whether killers are born, made, or a combination of both. We've seen some people who almost seem to be born evil. They have good childhoods and grow up in very happy families. They live comfortable lives until one day they start killing. And those people absolutely do exist. Then we see the people where something pivotal happens to them and that's when they start to veer off. With Eileen though, it almost looks like she just never stood a chance from the beginning. When we say this is a complicated case, we really mean it. When you guys hear the full story of the things she went through during her early years, and the kind of life she led, you really see the story of a forgotten young girl who went down probably the worst path she could have gone down. I want to clarify that at the end of the day, this is someone who took the lives of seven men. Nothing that happens to you can justify doing something that heinous. But you can't help but think that if a single person had actually cared about her when she was a child, that she wouldn't have ended up where she did. It's been really interesting diving into all the details of Eileen's life, especially since recently there were a lot of people somewhat glorifying her on the internet, especially TikTok, uh, and it was kind of making her into a bit of a martyr for women's rights, which... Uh, in my personal opinion, was kind of misplaced. And we're going to clarify, right? I'm going to interrupt Charlotte. Yeah, we're going to take this stance right now that we both agree she is not a martyr for women's no, rights. And we're going to talk no. about that. We need to clarify that right away. Yeah. That's not the kind of episode no, 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 this no, no, is no, going to no, be. No. But yeah, we're, no. our goal is to help you guys understand what made her the way that she was. Exactly. We're, we're gonna get into it, but Eileen was known to change her story and lie about the events surrounding the murders she committed. And at the end of the day, like Dina said before, she took the lives of seven people. In my opinion, not the best figurehead for women's rights. We're also gonna be talking about the resources that we used throughout the episode. Eileen was a woman who loved to talk, and because of that, we have a lot of information directly from her that helps us at least try to better understand her. And we do want to point out that like some of the other folks we've covered, Eileen talking a lot means that a fair bit of what she said was absolute bullshit. It's interesting because when I was researching, I cross-referenced a lot of stuff. So I'd watch an interview with her and then go back and read the letter that she wrote to her friend about it. And it's interesting to see not only her thoughts that she expresses during the interview, but you also get to see how she felt about the interview too. And I think that adds a little bit more to it. Well, and these are the letters that she wrote to her childhood friend Dawn, right? Yes. So the book is called Dear Dawn. And a big part of the book is the letters that she wrote to her while on death row. This is one of the books that we used as a resource this week, and it's not always a factual source, but it gives us a unique insight into her thoughts and her state of mind. Dawn was someone who knew her on a really personal level, and she said something in another interview that stuck with us. She called Eileen a smart woman who just never got to be seen. It does make you wonder what her life would have been like if she had been born into different circumstances. Well, we have a lot to cover here, and we're looking at about a three-part series, so let's get started with the childhood of Eileen Wernos. 
As far as serial killer childhoods go, Eileen Wernos have probably one of the worst ones that we have covered to date. We really want to emphasize the fact that we aren't about to tell you all of this in an attempt to justify what she's going to later do. Exactly. By understanding the abuse and trauma that she went through in her early life, we can start to understand the things that led her to go down the path that she did. With some of the people we've covered, it's hard to tell exactly what happened to them to cause them to kill. With Eileen, it's impossible to pinpoint exactly where things started to go wrong because it seems like her life from the very beginning was filled with nothing but neglect and abuse. Her father, a man named Leo Dale Pittman, was 18 years old when he met her mother, Diane Wernos. She was only 14. The two married on June 3, 1954, and her brother Keith would be born a year later. Her mother filed for divorce from her father two months before giving birth to their daughter. And with that, Eileen Carol Pittman was born February 29, 1956. She grew up in the nearby area of Troy, but was born in Rochester, Michigan. She is a leap year baby. Oh, I wonder if that means anything, like, astrologically. Okay, so I tried to look it up because oh, okay. I was curious, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I was like, is this good or bad? And interestingly enough, some sources say that it's incredibly bad luck. Oh, no. While the other half that I read said that it's very good luck. So, okay, so it's like black cat. Some yeah. people believe good luck, some people believe bad luck. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Her father, Leo, was diagnosed with schizophrenia, and he struggled with alcoholism. He was known to be abusive to many of those around him, including his own mother. Eileen would not use his last name, instead using her mother's maiden name, Wernos. At the time of her birth... Leo Pittman was serving a prison sentence for the sexual assault and attempted murder of a seven-year-old girl. He would die by his own hand while serving that sentence when Eileen was only 16 years old. Considering what little we know about him, it's most definitely for the best that he was not involved in her life. Her mother was incredibly neglectful. Keith and Eileen often went without food and lived in absolute squalor. If all that wasn't bad enough, when their mother was around, she deprived the children of another thing they desperately needed, affection. When Eileen was only four years old, her mother Diane decided that parenting wasn't really her thing anymore, and she left her children with her parents Lori and Britta Wernos. Eileen grew up thinking that her grandparents were actually her biological parents. Which seems to happen a lot with serial killers. I mean, like, it look sure at Ted Bundy, does. right? Um, so Eileen and Keith were legally adopted by their grandparents, and they raised them as their own, along with their children, Barry and Lori. And if this seems like a case of a person realizing that they're an unfit parent and leaving their children with someone capable, you're about to be very disappointed. There's not a ton available about Barry and Lori, because they were technically her aunt and uncle, but in the Dear Dawn letters, she does mention that they both graduated and went to college. She does mention that they did not get along. Eileen and Keith went from one bad situation to an arguably worse one. Both of her grandparents were alcoholics, and her grandfather should have been locked up alongside her father for the things he was doing. This guy is an absolute monster. He openly abused animals in front of her, in one case killing a cat that she was told she wasn't allowed to keep as a pet. It Fuck was, this guy. Uh, straight up. Just for real. Like, I was just saying, my grandparents I'm incredibly close with. They're wonderful human beings. Classic grandparents. Spoil you to death. Love you lots. And it breaks my heart when people have abusive fucking family members. It, it's man. sad because, you know, her parents couldn't take care of her. So you would hope that yeah. they would leave her in the hands of someone capable, but... Things just got Like, worse. out of the frying pan into the fire, honestly. Pretty well, yep. It was also reported that Eileen's grandfather would physically and sexually assault her. Now, this is something that she would later deny was true in her letters. There are a few things that were reported, like her having an incestuous relationship with her brother Keith, that she or someone else said at one point that she would later deny. In the Dear Dawn letter, she says this, and we want to quickly point out that she does refer to her grandfather as her father in this letter. And don't mind if I stumble over some of it, because it is exactly written how she wrote it, and her spelling was not the greatest. So she goes on to say, Okay, now I'm confused, you see. I explicitly clarified myself. My father, grandfather, never raped me, and that the cops made it up. My dad had nothing to do with these killings. My dad was a stringent bastard, but otherwise all right. He was never a pervert of any of us. Matter of fact, he was so shy of his tits and belly from being big, if he mowed the lawn, he'd leave his shirt on. He never hardly swore even, anyway. She claimed that the police made all of this up. However, multiple people, including Dawn, have stated that Eileen was being physically abused 
badly by her grandfather. Eileen changes her story when it comes to a lot of different things and it can make it difficult to track the truth with her. Surviving sexual assault, especially at the hands of a family member, is an incredibly complicated thing to go through and it's always possible that it was just easier for her to tell Dawn that it didn't happen. But because we cannot confirm one way or the other, we're gonna leave it at that, although she does display a lot of signs of someone who was abused at a young age. Plus trauma can really fuck up your uh, ability to remember things too, oh, right? 100%. We saw this a lot when we covered Pee Wee Gaskins, who interestingly enough also preyed on victims that he found while hitchhiking. They were both serial killers who lived that drifter lifestyle. You're exactly right. And with the drifter lifestyle often come drifter stories. We do know that Barry and Lori testified in court that she was not sexually assaulted by her grandfather, their father, as a child. And honestly, at the end of the day, we do know that she was being abused in some capacity and that in itself should never have been happening. At this point, she wasn't getting along with either of her grandparents and was mostly living out in the woods near their house to escape them. She literally slept outside at this point. If she was lucky, she would find a couch to crash on or someone would have a car or shed for her to sleep in, but she mostly stayed outside at this point and no one cared whether or not she went to school. She spent most of her time partying. She also began to exchange sexual favors for things like alcohol and cigarettes. She learned from a very early age that this was a way of survival for her and by age 11, she was actively selling her body to young boys in the area. When Eileen was only 14 years old, she was sexually assaulted by an older man and became pregnant. In the mind of a monster documentary, she talks about what happened. She says there was an older married man who would hang out with all the kids. He would buy them alcohol and weed and they would have parties at his house. He was someone that her grandfather knew and was around the same age. In the interview, she says that one evening they were all partying at his house. As the night went on, more and more of the kids left until Eileen was the only one that remained because, unlike the other kids, she wasn't going to school the following morning. He assaulted her that evening. She was then sent to a home for unwed mothers in Detroit. Now we do want to point out that in the Dear Dawn letters, she says that this happened while she was hitchhiking home from a party. And that's a great example of how her stories change. She says one thing in the interview, but wrote a completely different story to Dawn. So it's hard to say what actually happened, but either way, she was assaulted by a much older man and had his baby. To be fair, I think when you go through the amount of trauma and turmoil that she went through, that things can start blending together and your memory can get foggy, but who knows? Yeah, absolutely. She named the baby Keith Arnold Wernos after her brother. He was adopted very shortly after his birth and she would never see him again. The adoption was a closed one and there are no public records of him. We don't know if he knows who his mother was and we honestly don't even know whether or not he's still alive. If he is, he would be 52 years old this year. After she gave birth, she returned home and her relationship with her grandfather became even worse. He threw her out again and things would get even worse for her after this. She began to run away from home on a regular basis and eventually ended up in juvenile hall. At this point, she had developed quite a temper and it didn't take a lot to set her off. She was often getting into fights with those around her. She was not attending school very often and when she did, she struggled to pay attention in class. It was clear that she seemed to have both hearing and vision problems, but this was never addressed by a doctor. She would drop out of school in grade nine and it was around that time that her grandmother, the woman that she had known as her mother, would pass away. Eileen was actively selling her body at around this time and she hadn't been home in a little while. Her grandfather was obviously very aware that she'd run away and he was not going out of his way to get her to come home. However, he didn't want to get in trouble for completely and utterly neglecting her, so he reported her as missing. She wrote about this in the letters saying, and again, friends, we're reading this as it was written. And uh, here we go. And you know, I did tell you now that I'd finally write to you about that school. I'm off to telling some tales, so get prepared. Make your hair fly way on up in the air. Shh. She goes on to say, Well, as you know, way back at the age of 15, I ran away from home for the third and last time. The other times were at the age of 13 and 14. Now, Mom cared, but Dad didn't. But in order for themselves not to get in any trouble with the law, they did as any normal parent should do and finally filed a runaway report, with Dad having a plan behind it. I had no idea of once I was caught. Then of course, as you know, during the third split from the house, mom dies, unaware to. I had no idea she was so sick. And she did in the morning. And I was at the pits about to be hunted down by Lori and some of the Shelley girls and dad's maverick Lori was driving. 
Now, you may have been with him, Dom, but I can't remember everyone there. I was beginning to get way burned out from the whole mess, so please forgive me if you were and I've forgotten. Anyway, from the car, someone came down to the beach and told me Lori was up there and needed to talk to me. So I made my way up the embankment to the car only to find her full of tears. Then she laid on the shocking news and split, just to leave me likewise. The news got to the cops fast that I was around the area after that. Surely by Lori, Barry, or Dad, but because of an uncle or cuss, can't remember what kind of kin he was, being one of the cops in Troy, I believe I was overlooked for a while as a runaway so I could attend her funeral. Yet it would be 24 hours later, after I did, that I'd sure enough be rounded up on my way to a juvenile facility out in Pontiac. Now let me tell you, that center was something else, full of uck and disgust. Hate was everywhere, and nothing was being accomplished because of it. And it wouldn't be two days there that I'd get locked down in a tiny cell away from the others for giving a matron the finger. I believe they left me around a week or so. As the one I gave the finger to, knew very well about my mom's death, having just died, but did they care? Well, hell no. So to sum that up, she showed up at the funeral, only to be caught and sentenced to six months in the Adrian Girls School. She was officially declared a ward of the state and abandoned by every adult that was supposed to have cared for her. She admits that she doesn't remember. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because comes... she says, I don't know if you were there, Dawn. Exactly. I'm sorry. Yeah. So that right there, I mean, again, it's a lot of stuff for her to remember. It's a lot of traumatic stuff for her to remember. It is likely that she's forgetting. And she admits that, you know, I don't remember everything. Absolutely. After only two weeks at the girls' school, she attempted to run away. She volunteered to help in the kitchen and took off when no one was watching her. She ran straight into a nearby forest and attempted to hide out. However, they had sent dogs out to catch her, along with a huge group of men. Eventually, one of them caught up to her and brought her back. It wasn't long until she tried to escape again. This time, she was on the run for three weeks before she was caught and brought back. As far as we know, she didn't leave the school because she was being punished. It seems like she left because she was homesick and just didn't want to be there. Actually, this is one of the few times that we see what she was like when she had actual structure and rules in her young life. And it's short-lived, but it actually does seem like she responded well to it. Rather than punish her for the second escaped attempt, they made a deal with her that if she could behave for 60 days, they would release her. She did this without incident and was released. During the next couple of years, she hitchhiked and sold her body in order to survive. She was arrested again at the age of 18 for driving under the influence and for firing a gun out of a moving vehicle. She would later be charged with failure to appear in court. After this, she made her way to Florida, the state where she would find infamy as one of the state's most well-known serial killers to date. And for Florida, that's saying something. But infamy isn't all that she found in Florida. Oh no, she found herself a husband. Not just any kind of husband, too. She found herself the 69-year-old rich yacht club president kind of husband, a man named Louis Fell, and he fell madly in love with young Eileen. ba dum -tsh. And that is what the 2020 movie Eileen Wernos' American Boogie Woman is about. So I made it a little over halfway into this glorious film before I turned it off. Dina made me watch the trailer and yeah. it's it's something else. It's something. So it's currently got a 20% rating on Rotten Tomatoes and I think that's really, really generous. <laughs> uh, Louis Fell is played by Tobin Bell, who many of you may recognize from the Saw movies, which I thought was pretty cool, but I'm just like not a huge fan of like serial killer I, dramatization yeah, movies. Yeah, I agree. I very much agree. Yeah, like documentaries, they can be interesting and they can be done well from like an educational standpoint, but this was like inaccurate and it was clearly just made to tell like an outlandish suspenseful story and even charlotte got that just oh, from the trailer yeah like guys it's... if you go watch the trailer you can just type in american boogie woman into youtube it'll come up yeah it's about three minutes of well, you'll see. Yeah, <laughs> check it out. Let us know what you think. But that all being said, let's just take a quick sec to talk about Louis Fell and what happened between him and Eileen. Louis Fell was born on June 28th, 1907 in Pennsylvania. We don't know a lot about his early life, but we do know that he moved to Florida and amassed a great fortune. He married once in 1928 and the couple had a daughter, but the marriage did not last. He remarried shortly after in 1932. That marriage ended too, and we don't know a ton about what Louis was up to between 1932 and 1976 when he met Eileen. He mostly worked, made money, did rich guy things. He became the president of the Yacht Club. 
He started off giving boat tours to the wealthy and took the time to listen and learn about investment opportunities that were coming up. He took advantage of the things he learned and eventually he was not only a multimillionaire himself, but a rather influential person. Man, I feel like it must have been so much easier to just become like a millionaire yacht club, pl- yacht club president back in the day. It, it seems like it. Like, I mean, as a, a not to jump on the sexism train for a sec, but like as a man in those days... Living their best lives oh, in the 70s. Oh, hundred percent. So, he was the one who oversaw the entire operation of the yacht club. He was in charge of promoting the club, overseeing employees, and much, much more. He basically ran the whole thing, and everyone in that scene knew exactly who he was. And I'm sure we can all imagine how shocked his friends and family were when 69-year-old Lewis told them about the new woman he was seeing. Eileen was only 20 years old when she met Lewis. He instantly took a liking to her energy, attitude, and of course, her youth. I mean, not to make it all about appearances, but she was a pretty good-looking young woman at this sure. point. Like, Lewis probably thought he struck gold when he met her. He wanted a good-looking and energetic young wife at his side, and she wanted to be taken care of. So at first, this seemed like a pretty decent little arrangement for both of them. Eileen spent her time with him on his boat, tanning near his pool, and all in all, enjoying the good things in life for probably the first time in her life. It was a far shot from her sleeping in cars in the woods only a few years prior, that's for sure. I mean, really, to go from her childhood to being married to a literal yacht-owning millionaire... A big jump for Eileen. And Lewis Bell, he was pretty proud of his new wife, and he even had the wedding announcement published in the local newspaper. Unfortunately, Eileen did not want to seem to settle down and be a wife. She spent a lot of her time spending money that he was giving her at local bars. She would get extremely intoxicated and would constantly get into fights with other people. She was even arrested for assault at one point. Thanks to the newspaper announcement, people at these bars recognized Eileen as Lewis's wife. People were already gossiping about the fact that he married a much younger woman. Her behavior only added fuel to the fire for them. Lewis, obviously, didn't like all this, and it was a huge source of contention between the two. His friends and family weren't exactly supportive of the marriage, and this certainly didn't help. It didn't take long until Eileen turned the violence onto her own husband. And this would be bad enough under any other circumstances, but we just want to remind you, He's 69 years old. She flew into a rage and beat that 69-year-old with his own cane. Yep. So luckily, at that point, he had enough, and he immediately filed to have the marriage annulled after only nine weeks together. And he was smart about it, too. He immediately got a restraining order against her. And we talked about this um, before we started recording, but, like, if she had just done things differently here... and. You know what? Far be it from anyone to judge her. You know, some people probably were calling her a gold digger or oh, yeah, whatever. Oh, yeah, of course. But at the end of the day, he wanted an energetic young wife. Yep. She wanted someone to look after her. Yep. It could have been an amicable arrangement. I mean, really, it's mutually beneficial. They both would have gotten what they wanted, and she could have lived a very, very comfortable life. Yes. But that is not what happened. And as far as we know, the couple never spoke again. Louis Bell lived until the year 2000, and he never remarried. I honestly wouldn't blame him at that point. Like, he's, uh, zero for three. Well, third time's supposed to be the charm, and his third time was a fucking serial killer. To be fair, he probably dodged a bullet getting out when he did. 100%. At the time of his death, he was worth around $5 million, and it seems like after they split, he continued to live a very comfortable life. Their marriage would officially be annulled on July 21st, 1976. A few days prior to that, Eileen was devastated to learn about the death of her brother Keith to esophageal cancer. Eileen, his next of kin, received a $10,000 insurance payout. And this would have been a life-changing amount of money for her. Absolutely. So this would have been about $52,000 in today's money. That U.S. Would have, that would have been, it would be life-changing for me now. 100%. Like, it would have been enough for her to get herself set up reasonably well, especially considering the amount of time she spent sleeping outside. Like, I feel like it would have been enough to upgrade things for her. Oh, Absolutely. In August of 1976, Eileen was arrested for drunk driving and was given a $105 fine, but then she basically partied the rest of the money away. She did end up buying herself a new car, but she crashed it not too long afterwards. Things didn't improve from there for her. 
At the age of 22, she attempted to take her own life by shooting herself in the stomach. Can I just... No. Uh, oh my god, no. Oh, so this was sadly one of the many suicide attempts that she had made in this point in her life. She continued to live a life full of sex work and crime, and as she called it, the Robin Biz. In 1981, at the age of 25, she was arrested again, this time in Florida for armed robbery. She stole some money and cigarettes from a convenience store and found herself spending almost two months in jail. Almost a year later, to the day she was arrested again, this time for forging checks. She spent the majority of her 20s committing petty crimes and getting arrested. In 1986, she was arrested for car theft, resisting arrest, and possession of a stolen ID. When police searched the stolen vehicle, they also found a gun and some ammunition. Less than six months later, she was detained after a man claimed that she pulled a gun on him and demanded that he give her $200. They once again discovered a gun and ammo in the car that she was driving. The same year, while at a bar in Daytona Beach called Zodiac, Eileen met 24-year-old Tyria Moore. Tyria was a hotel maid who sometimes worked as a forklift driver, among other things. She had no links to the criminal world. She had recently left her incredibly conservative hometown in Ohio, where she felt that she couldn't live openly as a lesbian. Eileen had dated a woman prior to this, but it hadn't ended very well. She felt incredibly hard for Tyria, and from this point on, it seems as if her main priority was to make sure that she had everything she wanted. She did this, of course, by continuing to do sex work as well as robbing people. Eileen was open with her about the crimes that she had committed as well as the fact that she was actively working as a sex worker. Tyria, again, had no criminal history. However, it doesn't seem as if she had too big of a problem with Eileen committing crimes when it benefited her. In her letters to Dawn, she says, She always spent my bread that I'd make, and I never had a chance to. So the next day I'd go out and make more. It was so easy to. And big bucks. All the bars, fancy nightclubs, and restaurants we'd hit, as well as her buying clothes for herself. I had one beat-up bra, a few pairs of underwear, wreck tennis shoes, three pairs of pants, and five t-shirts to my name. She had gobs of clothes. I couldn't help it. I was insanely in love with her and just wanted her to have it all. I was her puppet. In the letter, she talks a lot about how she felt that she was manipulated by Tyria, but she also talks a lot about how much she still loved her, even to the end. Which is honestly pretty sad considering what will happen between the two of them at the end of Eileen's killing spree. The two spent their time living in motel rooms or sleeping at friends' houses. They were together for almost five years, and while this was not the life that Tyria was used to, she didn't complain that much. She was open about the fact that she didn't support Eileen working as a sex worker, and this was a huge problem between the two of them. However, she was aware that the majority of the money that Eileen was making came from this, and she happily enjoyed the financial benefits of it. Throughout the course of their relationship, Tyria continued to work on and off while Eileen continued what she was doing. The life she was living was an incredibly high-risk one, and it wouldn't take long until things would escalate in the absolute worst way possible. This would end with Eileen Wuornos killing seven men in the course of only 12 months. Her first victim was a 51-year-old man named Richard Mallory. He was the owner of an electronics repair shop in Clearwater, Florida. Richard Mallory had earned himself a reputation as a man who would sometimes vanish for days on end to go on huge binges. He was also known as being quite paranoid, never keeping an employee on for too long, and changing his locks on a regular basis. Richard Mallory had also been convicted of attempted sexual assault, and that's something that's important to point out because this would not be made public until after Eileen's trial. On November 30th, Richard picked up Eileen to purchase sexual services from her. Eileen claimed that he drove her to an abandoned area where he viciously sexually assaulted her. And she does describe this in the Dear Dawn letters, and I spent quite a while trying to find an excerpt where she talks about it that wasn't downright horrific to read, but that wasn't possible at all. It's just the whole nature it's of it is not Awful, nice. yeah. yeah. It, I honestly, like, there were a lot of parts that I thought we could add, but we don't need to read it again. Nope. Um, her story about this night, it would change a few times, but this was the first murder and also the first time that she would claim self-defense. 
Since Richard Mallory kept to himself a lot, it took a little while before his absence was noticed, especially considering he had a habit of vanishing for days at a time. A few days after his murder, his 1977 Cadillac was found abandoned and this set off alarm bells. On the 13th of December, James Davis and Jimmy Bonchi were walking down a dirt road close to Interstate 95 in Volusia County in hopes of finding scrap metal that they could sell. To their shock, they found a body that had been wrapped up in a carpet. They alerted the authorities who were able to identify the body as that of Richard Mallory through fingerprinting. He had been shot several times and it appeared that he was fatally wounded by two shots to his lungs. Because Richard was considered to live a high-risk lifestyle, police immediately interviewed those that he had been involved with prior, including an exotic dancer who was originally considered a suspect. However, she was quickly cleared of any involvement in his death. Whatever little leads they had quickly dried up and the murder of Richard Mallory was considered a cold case. That is, until the bodies of more middle-aged men began to turn up at an alarming rate. And that is where we will pick up next week with the story of Eileen Wernos. So, well, that's quite the start Ooh. for you guys. So, just to cap it all off, at this point, she's 33 years old. She's met the woman who she thinks is the love of her life, and she has unfortunately started what will now be known as one of the most infamous murder sprees committed by a woman in American history. Next week, we will discuss how quickly she escalated and what led to the murders of six other men. We're also going to start getting into how she was finally caught. I personally have been wanting to cover Eileen for a very, very long time. Her story has fascinated me since I saw the movie Monster when I was like 12, which I probably <laughs> shouldn't have watched at that age, but I mean, I was already pretty interested in true crime at that point, like any normal child would be, so I just remember <laughs> like the story fascinating me and wondering like what would lead someone to go down this road. I also saw the Monster movie with Charlize Theron pretty young. Uh, I was probably in junior high. My two best friends and I rented it thinking it was more of a horror movie, and don't get me wrong, it definitely is horrific, but just not in the way we expected. I was shocked at the end when I realized that it was based on a true story. To say that the adults in Eileen's childhood failed her is a massive understatement. It's a beginning we see all the time, time and time and again with the people we talk about, and it's not a story that ever gets easier to tell. I really do think this is one of the hardest cases that we've talked about it's it's up there it's definitely up there i mean as as a woman myself i i always find it kind of difficult in the, in a way to learn about female killers because it's not something that i kind of see within myself like it's not really a surprise when you come across a male killer it's true and i mean especially it, you're made a really good point there because during this time in history in the late 70s up to like the 90s the amount of serial killers that we were seeing oh, especially sure. on the highways yeah. they were all men and that's exactly why she stands out because she was doing this during a time where serial killers were really i mean all over the place oh, the journey, yeah. especially on the highways and they were all men and a lot of them were a specific demographic of man and then here's eileen who is and she also doesn't different. track the same mo as most female exactly. killers right like the ones we've covered before it's mostly poisoning for women and women tend to kill in order to get away from men or to benefit financially exactly. right like it's but it's not usually a super um bloody death whereas no. with her it was very much so it's an interesting case for Absolutely. sure so next week it is going to be a bit of a rough one because we're going to be discussing all of the other victims that came after richard mallory and we know we've spoken a lot about the terrible things that happened to eileen but those of you listening you can't forget that this does end in the deaths of not only seven men but also in the death of eileen herself at the hands of the United States judicial system. This is a case that's hard for me to talk about like morally because you're pulled in a lot of different directions because what she did was absolutely wrong. There is zero doubt there. But when you read about her childhood and the fact that really no one gave a crap about her, you wonder if those seven men would still be alive today if her life had just gone in a slightly different direction as a child. Because if one person, just one person had stopped and said, hey, Maybe this child shouldn't be sleeping in a car in the middle of winter outside. Let's help her. But no one did. And that's one of the things that makes this story so tragic to me. I say time and time and again, and I think a lot of people will probably agree, I, you can feel incredibly sad and heartbroken for the child that went through that situation. But at the end of the day, 
as an adult, you have choices to make. Yep, 100%. So, that all being said, this is likely going to be a three-part series. We hope you enjoyed the first part, or, you know, maybe enjoyed's not the right word, but we hope you learned something. Yes, we hope you learned something. And we really, really appreciate the fact that we've made it to 30 episodes, you guys. Not only are people still listening, but it seems like we're, like, meeting new people that enjoy the podcast every week, too. Yeah. Which is, like, super cool. So, hi. Yes, hello. Thanks. Welcome. <laughs> the last six months of, being, of doing all this have been fucking awesome, you guys. Like, I, and we've come a long way, I feel like. Yes, yeah. seriously. Like, okay, after this, you guys, go listen to, like, five minutes of the first episode that we did. We, we, we've we been learning. We learn and for <laughs> sure. We also want to take a second, of course, to thank all the lovely folks who have been supporting us on Patreon. If you haven't had a chance to check it out yet and you'd like to support the podcast, please go to patreon.com slash the grim curriculum and check us out. You can join for as little as $3 a month Canadian and we have some fun perks including movie night, stickers, behind the scenes videos and a bunch of other stuff too. And with that being said, we do want to take a second to thank everyone in the Grim VIP Patreon tier. You guys are the bomb. So once again, a big humongous thank you to Lisa, Brian, Hillary, Pink Flamingo 20, and RSG. We have been having so much fun with Patreon, you guys. So we do a behind-the-scenes video every week. And right now we're working on a series of four where we share the research process, writing, recording, and then editing. And we also just launched our very first monthly story time episode, and that's available for all tiers, again, for $3 Canadian, which is like the cost of a double-double. Like, that's yeah. pretty good. Yeah, yeah. All of the money we do make is just going to go straight back in, and we're working towards merch. We're looking to get that set up as well. And it, it just makes, basically, anything that we're doing, it, it makes it so much better, more refined. It, it all goes back into the podcast. And it seems so weird to be like, hey, we have a Patreon. I know. It's crazy. Isn't that cool? And the fact that you, like, you guys already have, like, hopped on and you're being so good at supporting us. It, it truly, truly means the world that you guys are out there supporting. We love doing this. Absolutely. Like, this is just, it's it's been an absolute joy to get to do this. And we both love talking about this kind of stuff so much that having an outlet to talk about it and people who are willing to listen to us talk about it is just wonderful. It's wacky and wild and yeah. we love it. Uh, also, guys, just a quick reminder, we are uh, doing Extra Life again this year. Thank you to everyone that uh, tuned into Dina and my stream. or Thanks. rather, Yeah, Dina's stream that I was a part of last week. It was a lot of fun. We're trying to plan something else before game day on November 5th, but on November 5th, we'll be doing a bunch of stuff. So keep tuned keep tuned stay tuned we'll keep you all in the loop on social media on twitter all that good stuff and let you know what's going on it's such a great cause you guys like we had so much fun streaming together yeah. so we're hoping to do one more and then the big one but uh please check us out it's uh stream daddies on the extra life website you can look us up yes and i'll have the links down below in the description it's all on social media it's for a good cause until then, make sure you don't miss out on the Grim Curriculum news by following us on Instagram at the Grim Curriculum and Grim Curriculum on Twitter. You can also find us on social media. I'm ominous underscore walrus on Twitter, ominous walrus on Instagram, and I'm also ominous underscore walrus on Twitch. And I'm Dina V tweets on Twitter, Dina V I G on Instagram, and Dina V on Twitch. We are also on YouTube. Make sure that you subscribe to us unless you're watching from YouTube, in which case, hello, lovely hello. people. We love you. Uh, but we're trying to hit right now 400 subscribers yes. on there, so that'd be super cool. Help us out. You guys helped us blast past 300 not too long yeah. ago, so we're reaching for the stars. We can keep going. Go, I just know it. Yeah, go watch our videos, too. Play them back. Check us out. Do the thing. It all goes towards us basically getting better. Yeah. So, yeah. Thanks. As always, thank you so much for listening. This has been The, the Grim, Grim Curriculum. Curriculum.